Welcome back to our stenosis series. In part one, we talked about aortic stenosis, what cause aortic stenosis, and quantitation based on ASE guidelines. If you missed it, you'll find the link on our aortic stenosis video in the description. Now in part two, we're shifting gears to focus on mitral stenosis. We'll break down how it affects blood flow, what to look for on echo, and how to apply the ASE guidelines in real clinical cases. Let's get into it. Let's talk about what causes mitral stenosis, because understanding the why behind the narrowing helps us better interpret what we see on echo. The most common cause of mitral stenosis worldwide is rheumatic fever. This is a post-inflammatory condition that leads to classic features like commissural fusion, meaning that the edges of the valve leaflets where they open are stuck together. Then we have degenerative or calcific mitral stenosis, more common in older adults. Instead of affecting the leaflets, this form typically involves calcification of the mitral annulus, making the valve stiff and less mobile. Other less frequent causes include congenital MS, which often involves abnormalities in the subvalvular apparatus, and secondary forms like carcinoid heart disease, drug-induced valve thickening, and systemic inflammatory diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Each of these has a slightly different mechanism, but they all lead to the same, a mitral valve that doesn't open the way it should. Let's walk through the heart and uncover what happens in mitral stenosis. In a healthy heart, blood returns from the lungs, full of oxygen, into the left atrium. From there, it flows freely through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, which then pumps it out to the aorta and into the body. But in mitral stenosis, the mitral valve is narrowed. This restricted opening makes it harder for blood to move from the left atrium to the left ventricle during diastole. So the left atrium has no choice but to push harder, and over time it starts to stretch and enlarge or dilate due to the pressure overload. As the left atrium enlarges, it starts to crowd nearby structures in the chest. It can compress the esophagus, causing what's called dysphagia, or difficulty swallowing. It can press on the left recurrent laryngeal nerve that loops around near the heart, causing hoarseness of voice, also known as dysphonia. It may even push against the bronchi, leading to a chronic cough. This enlargement disrupts the heart's electrical signals causing the atrium to quiver. This is atrial fibrillation, a chaotic rhythm that causes the atrium to stop contracting effectively. Because it's no longer contracting effectively, blood pools. This is a condition called blood stasis. Blood typically pools in the left atrium. From here, the clot or thrombus can travel. If it dislodges, it becomes an embolus. It can shoot into the brain and cause an embolic stroke. This is when it becomes a life-threatening complication. As the blood struggles to pass through the narrowed mitral valve, pressure backs up into the pulmonary veins, then back to the lungs. The lungs begin to fill with fluid, a condition called pulmonary edema. This brings dyspnea or shortness of breath, especially during activity. The patient also gets orthopnea. This is when the patient lies flat. Fluid spreads more evenly through the lungs, worsening the shortness of breath. And when fluid pools overnight and wakes a person up gasping for air, that's called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, or PND. As the pressure in the lungs continues to rise, we reach pulmonary hypertension, a condition where the arteries in the lungs become narrowed and stiff. This adds strain to the right side of the heart, which now has to work harder to push blood from the atrium to the tricuspid valve, through the pulmonic artery, and into the lungs. Over time, the right heart begins to fail, leading to right-sided heart failure. And when we get right-side heart failure, the blood backs up to the superior vena cava back to the jugular veins, causing jugular vein distension. The blood also backs up to the inferior vena cava, causing hepatic congestion, ascites, and further down causing ankle or lower limb edema. Meanwhile, less blood is making it through to the left ventricle, and ultimately, less oxygen-rich blood is reaching the body. This leads to fatigue, cold extremities, and exercise intolerance. When the demand for oxygen rises like during a workout or even walking upstairs, the heart can't keep up. That's when SAD kicks in, syncope or fainting due to lack of blood to the brain, angina or chest pain from inadequate oxygen to the heart muscle, dyspnea, which again is breathlessness, from both lung congestion and low cardiac output. Mitral stenosis begins with a narrowed valve, but its ripple effects are widespread. Pressure builds behind the valve causing the left atrium to dilate. That enlargement causes compression symptoms, electrical disturbance, blood clots, and the risk of stroke. Pulmonary congestion follows as the blood from the left atrium backs up to the pulmonic veins and back to the lungs, leading to pulmonary edema, shortness of breath, orthopnea, PND, and pulmonary hypertension causing the right side of the heart to work harder and over time leading to right side heart failure. And through it all, because of the lack of blood going to the left ventricle to the systemic circulation, 
The body suffers from low cardiac output, low oxygen delivery, triggering the classic SAD triad. The clinical presentation of mitral stenosis often begins subtly, then gradually progresses. One of the earliest and most common symptoms is progressive dyspnea, that is, increasing shortness of breath, especially with exertion. This occurs due to elevated pressures in the pulmonary circulation as blood backs up into the lungs from the obstructed mitral valve. On physical examination, a patient may exhibit a malar flush, a reddish-purple discoloration over the cheeks. This is thought to be due to vasodilation and chronic hypoperfusion, a hallmark of long-standing mitral stenosis with low cardiac output. Auscultation of the heart reveals hallmark findings. At the apex of the heart, which is located at the left fifth intercostal space, along the mid-clavicular line, a mid-diastolic murmur can be heard. It is preceded by an opening snap, occurring just after the second heart sound, S2. The murmur is characterized by a low-pitched, diastolic rumble, and ends with a presystolic accentuation. When it comes to diagnosing valvular stenosis, not all imaging tools are created equal. That's why the American Society of Echocardiography, or ASE, has laid out clear, evidence-based guidelines to help us assess valve disease accurately and consistently. These methods are divided into three recommendation levels, based on strength of evidence and expert consensus. Let's break them down. Level 1 recommendations are your gold standard. These are the methods that are not only appropriate but strongly recommended for all patients with valve stenosis. They're your go-to, first-line tools, reliable, proven, and central to routine clinical evaluation. They include 1. Mitral valve area by planimetry, wherein you directly trace the valve opening from the parasternal short axis window, MV level. 2. The mean pressure gradient, which is obtained using pulsed wave Doppler across the mitral valve. 3. Pulmonary artery systolic pressure, which is estimated using the tricuspid regurgitant jet, meaning the continuous wave Doppler is sampled through the tricuspid valve, typically in the apical four-chamber window. And lastly, pressure halftime, which reflects how quickly the left atrium empties into the left ventricle. These tools not only confirm the diagnosis, but help classify the stenosis as mild, moderate, or severe. For example, a mitral valve area greater than 1.5 square centimeters is usually mild. Around 1 to 1.5 is moderate, and less than 1 is considered severe. Level 2 recommendations are for when the Level 1 method doesn't give you the full picture. These tests are used selectively often to clarify more complex or borderline cases, or to guide further decision-making when echo findings are unclear. Level 2 recommendations include, first, the continuity equation. It's based on the principle of conservation of flow, that is, what goes in must come out. By comparing stroke volumes at the mitral valve and LVOT, we can calculate the mitral valve area, or MVA, especially useful when penimetry is unclear or technically limited. Next is the PISA method, short for proximal isovelocity surface area. This technique estimates mitral valve area by analyzing flow convergence on the atrial side of the valve. It's helpful in moderate to severe cases, though it requires good color Doppler images and experience in proper setup. And finally, stress echocardiography which can be performed using either exercise or pharmacologic agents like dobutamine. This test evaluates how the valve behaves under stress. It's especially valuable in patients with exertional symptoms but normal resting gradients. Level 3 recommendations are not advised for routine clinical use. However, they may still play a role in research settings or rare clinical situations, especially when other imaging methods aren't available or are inconclusive. For example, Cardiac catheterization is a level 3 recommendation for assessing valve stenosis. It's not recommended as part of the routine workup unless transthoracic echocardiography, or TTE, is inconclusive or technically limited. Let's dive deeper into the level 1 recommendations. The mitral valve area by PL animetry is one of the most reliable methods, but also one of the most technically challenging to perform. It requires a good quality image, proper timing, and precise alignment, because you want to be at the leaflet tips. You'll want to be in the parasternal short axis view at the mitral valve level. Tilt your tail inferiorly to get the narrowest opening of the MV that gives you that classic fish mouth appearance of the orifice. Scroll through your clip carefully and freeze it in mid-diastole when the valve is fully open. You'll usually see that the shape of the orifice is elliptical. Now you can start at any point inside the opening and proceed to tracing the MVA. In this example, our tracing gave us a mitral valve area of 1.97 square centimeters, which falls within the range of mild mitral stenosis. 
Next, let's look at the pressure gradient across the mitral valve, which is calculated by the machine for you using the Bernoulli principle. We start by using the continuous wave Doppler, placing the cursor through the mitral inflow, typically from the apical four-chamber window. Make sure you're looking above the baseline, since blood is flowing up towards your probe, from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Once you've lined it up, freeze the clip and trace the mitral valve velocity time integral, or MVVTI. This will give us both the MVVTI and the mean pressure gradient. It's also important to report the heart rate, since gradient measurements are flow-dependent. Now, if your patient is in atrial fibrillation, which is often a consequence of mitral stenosis, you'll want to average five cardiac cycles due to the irregular rhythm. Remember, in AFib, there's no coordinated atrial contraction, so you won't see an A-wave on the Doppler tracing, just a series of irregular passive flow patterns. We have an example on the right, where the mean pressure gradient across the mitral valve is 21 millimeters of mercury. That value falls into the severe mitral stenosis range. Note that a mean gradient less than 5 is considered mild. Between 5 and 10 is moderate, and anything greater than 10 is generally classified as severe. Moving forward to our third level 1 recommendation for assessing mitral stenosis, we have our pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Pulmonary artery systolic pressure, or PASP, doesn't directly measure the severity of mitral stenosis. It instead reflects the hemodynamic consequence of it. In other words, elevated pressures in the right ventricle suggest that mitral stenosis is starting to affect the lungs and the right heart. So we calculate PASP by estimating the systolic pressure gradient between the right ventricle and right atrium. This correlates closely with mitral valve resistance. The formula is PASP equals 4 times tricuspid regurgitation velocity squared plus the estimated right atrial pressure. We estimate RAP by evaluating the inferior vena cava, or IVC, using a subcostal window. Specifically, we look at two things, the diameter of the IVC and how much it collapses with inspiration, also called the sniff test. The IVC reflects central venous pressure because it drains directly into the right atrium. If the IVC is small and collapses completely, the right atrial pressure is likely low. If it's dilated and doesn't collapse much, the pressure is elevated. The ASE provides a reference table to estimate RAP. For example, an IVC diameter less than 2.1 cm that collapses more than 50% with a sniff suggests a normal RAP of around 3 mm of mercury. Intermediate findings fall somewhere in the middle, around 8 mm of mercury. If the IVC diameter is less than 2.1 cm and collapses less than 50%, or if the IVC is dilated and collapses more than 50%. If the IVC is dilated to greater than 2.1 cm and collapses less than 50%, RAP is estimated to be high at 15. Let's break this all down to four steps with actual examples. Step 1. Start by getting a good apical four-chamber view and place your continuous wave Doppler through the tricuspid valve. Now align your Doppler beam with the TR jet. Look below the baseline and trace the peak velocity. This value represents the pressure gradient between the right ventricle and right atrium, which you'll use to calculate PASP in the next step. So why are we measuring tricuspid regurgitation when we're talking about mitral stenosis? When mitral stenosis becomes significant, blood backs up into the left atrium and eventually into the pulmonary circulation. Over time, this leads to increased pressure in the pulmonary arteries, which can then strain the right side of the heart, leading to a consequence or mitral stenosis tricuspid regurg. Step 2 is to estimate right atrial pressure, or RAP. To do this, switch to your subcostal window and get a 2D clip of the inferior vena cava, or IVC. Then, ask the patient to sniff. This creates a sudden drop in intrathoracic pressure and should cause the IVC to collapse if the right atrial pressure is normal. Measure the IVC diameter and observe how much it collapses with that sniff. You can choose to measure it at peak collapse, or, if needed, eyeball whether it collapses by more than 50%. This step is important because the IVC is a direct pathway into the right atrium, so its size and collapsibility give us a good estimate of central venous pressure, and therefore RAP. For example, if the IVC is less than 2.1 cm and collapses more than 50%, RAP is 3 mm of mercury. If it's dilated and collapses less than 50%, RAP is high and estimated at 15 mm of mercury. Intermediate findings will fall at 8 mm of mercury. In our example, the IVC diameter measured 2.5 cm at rest, so it's dilated. When the patient sniffed, 
the IVC collapsed to 1.1 centimeters. That's a collapse of more than 50%. So according to the ASE guideline table, we would estimate the RAP as 8 millimeters of mercury. This value will be added to the TR jet gradient in the next step to calculate pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Step 3 is to plug in our values to calculate pulmonary artery systolic pressure, or PASP. The formula is PASP equals 4 times TRV max squared plus right atrial pressure. In our case, the tricuspid regurgitation peak velocity, or TRV max, is 2.64 meters per second, and the right atrial pressure, based on our IVC measurements, is 8 millimeters of mercury. Let's do the math. 4 times 2.64 squared equals approximately 27.9. Add the right atrial pressure of 8, and we get a PASP of 35.9 millimeters of mercury. Now the last step is to evaluate. Step 4. According to the ASE guidelines, a PASP of around 35 falls into the moderate pulmonary hypertension range. This tells us that our patient is beginning to experience elevated pressures in the pulmonary circulation, likely as a hemodynamic consequence of mitral stenosis. Let's move on to another important method for assessing mitral stenosis, pressure halftime, or PHT. It is measured in milliseconds. PHT is the time it takes for the pressure gradient between the left atrium and left ventricle to fall by half during diastole. On Doppler, this means measuring from the peak of early diastolic flow to the point where the gradient has dropped by 50%. Now, the good news is, most machines calculate this automatically when you trace the mitral inflow VTI envelope which should appear after the T-wave on the EKG. To obtain this, use continuous wave Doppler through the mitral valve, typically in the apical four-chamber view. Then bring the baseline down because the MVVTI is above it. Trace around the VTI. Then the machine will automatically compute for your MVVTI values, Vmax, mean PG, and PHT. Why do we care about pressure halftime? Because we use it to estimate the mitral valve area using this simplified formula, MVA equals 220 divided by PHT. So for example, if the pressure half time is 163 milliseconds, then the mitral valve area would be 220 divided by 163, which equals 1.35 square centimeters, which indicates a moderate mitral stenosis. Remember, the smaller your valve area, the more stenotic the valve is, because it indicates a smaller orifice for blood to flow into. PHT is particularly useful in patients where pelanimetry is difficult, or when an alternative MVA estimate is needed. To wrap up, here are the four primary methods we use to evaluate mitral stenosis severity, all recommended by the ASE. First, there's mitral valve area by pelanimetry. This is a direct measurement done by tracing the valve opening in the peristernal short-axis view, usually at the leaflet tips. When acquired correctly, it has the best correlation with actual valve area, but it takes skill and image quality to get it right. Next, we have the mean pressure gradient. Using continuous wave Doppler from the apical view, we measure the velocity of blood flow through the mitral valve. From that, the machine calculates the average pressure difference between the left atrium and left ventricle during diastole. It's a quick, reliable tool. But keep in mind, it's flow-dependent, so heart rate and rhythm matter. The third tool is pulmonary artery systolic pressure, or PASP. This doesn't measure stenosis directly. It reflects the hemodynamic consequences from the right side of the heart. We estimate it using the tricuspid regurgitation jet and IVC collapsibility to calculate how much pressure is backing up into the lungs because of the narrowed mitral valve. And finally, there's pressure halftime. This measures how long it takes for the transmitral gradient to fall by half. From there, we can estimate the mitral valve area using a simple formula. MVA equals 220 divided by PHT. It's especially helpful when planimetry isn't possible. Together, these four methods give us a more complete picture, combining structure, flow, and functional impact. That's why a comprehensive approach is key in every mitral stenosis evaluation. Each method offers a different perspective, structure, flow, and consequence. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this helped you understand mitral stenosis a little more clearly and gave you the confidence to apply these concepts in both class and clinical settings. If you found this helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your fellow ECHO classmates. And if you have questions, cases, or topics you'd like to see covered, drop them in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep scanning, keep learning, and I'll see you in the next video.